At the age of five, I was arrested at school. Two young men came in and asked, is Martin Stern here? And the teacher tried to deny I was there. But I didn't know what was going on. People had been careful not to tell me what they thought about the Nazis in case I repeated it with fatal consequences for them. And uh, I put my hand up and gave myself away. And as I was being taken out of that uh, little school hall, I looked round and I'll never forget the ashen face of the teacher. My sister, aged one year old, was arrested by Dutch police about the same time. We ended up in a prison camp in the Netherlands, uh, creosoted wooden huts, bare soil, big barbed wire fence, watchtowers, and I was told not to go anywhere near that fence because the soldiers in the watchtowers would shoot you dead. The food was terrible, f uh, vegetables you'd been and not a lot of those. And every week a train of goods trucks and cattle trucks taking people away, you know, crammed full. And I watched these trucks being loaded up. Eventually, of course, uh, my turn came. Most of those trucks had a sign on the side saying that they were going either to Auschwitz or Sobibor. The names were on the side of the trains. People didn't know what those names meant. But uh, my train was a similar train, but it went to a different place. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here. On arrival, I was removed from the other children by a Dutch woman prisoner who wanted to look after a couple of kids. Somebody had told her uh, that there were two children on this train from the Netherlands, uh, whose father had killed two German soldiers. And so she picked us. And she looked after us in whichever women's dormitory she was in, it changed all the time. She stole food for us. Uh, she did other things which were risking her life. It was highly irregular what she was doing. Eventually it was announced that children had to board the next train. Now, we weren't hidden. She couldn't keep us off that train. But uh, and, uh, believing that we would be going to our deaths, and it would mean her death too, she went with us to the assembly place to get on that train. She couldn't bear to let us go alone. And our names weren't called. The other children were killed in Auschwitz. My guess is that the list that was read out was the list of children in the children's building that by taking us from amongst the other children she had saved our lives. The Nazis lost, we eventually ended up in the Netherlands and were taken away from this wonderful woman who had risked her life for us repeatedly. And my sister and I uh, made lives in the Netherlands and then as children uh, in 1950 were moved to Britain, uh, to Manchester. And uh, I went to school and university, trained as a doctor, uh, became a hospital specialist in Leicester, uh, had uh, a wife, three children, seven grandchildren, and here I am. An amazing proportion of the population really do not know about the Holocaust. And of course there are people who deny that it happened or deny that it was anything like as bad as people claim or claim that the Jews uh, engineered it for uh, ulterior motives, uh, uh, horrific uh, libels against uh, the Jews of the world. Um, I realized late in my career, having really not talked about it uh, for uh, since a very short time after coming back from this prison town, that uh, if I didn't talk about it, uh, nobody would know. She 
She will be an extremely old lady now if she is still alive. If I met her, I think I would want to embrace her and weep. It was difficult, it is difficult changing from one country to another, um, especially without your parents. And of course, my sister and I were not the only children subjected to that. From the age of three to the age of seven, I had practically no contact with other children. You know, if you deliberately did that to a child uh, in uh, this country now, you would be uh, uh, rightly accused of uh, maltreating that child, abusing it. Uh, that itself has an influence. It is also, even between two very similar countries like the Netherlands and Britain, a cultural difference. The way you're expected to behave is uh, subtly, but in important ways, different. And for some, in some ways, I still haven't uh, fully acclimatized to Britain. Although, uh, it, 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 my, I, I feel more and more British as I get older. But uh, it, at the same time, there are benefits from moving to another country. Uh, it's a wonderful thing to become bilingual, even if it's a hard, and in my case it was an unpleasant process, but it seems to have worked more or less. And um, it, it, by knowing two languages, you learn to appreciate your original language and the beauty of language. It's a joy being bilingual and it protects you against dementia, I'm told. Uh, at the same time, I think all young people should, if they possibly can, spend some time living and working in another country and experiencing culture shock. It's very good for you. It has benefits. It, you learn to understand your own culture for a start. Um, so, yes, there are disadvantages. Uh, it pales into insignificance compared to what happened during the war, of course. Uh, but there are benefits and I'm so proud to be British. What I meant by that is that the Nazi system was very efficient. They were using the bureaucracy of a state and the bureaucracy uh, tradition of the Prussian army uh, and, and the Prussian state that flowed from it. Uh, it was very hard to escape the Nazi net, uh, at least uh, once they had caught you once they, they, if you were not hidden from them, and even then. Um, I think all the survivors I know uh, had something going wrong with that efficient system. In my own case, if a Dutch couple had not looked after me for two years in Amsterdam, keeping me out of the clutches of the Nazis, I would not have survived. Most Holocaust survivors were caught late. It was one of the secrets of survival. If I had been sent to Auschwitz or Sobibor, like most of the children in the prison camp, uh, I would not have survived. I would have gone straight to the gas chambers. If in uh, the prison town, Theresienstadt, um, I had not been taken out from the other children, uh, my name would have been read out to board that train to Auschwitz. If that woman who was looking after my sister and I had not told me fiercely to not go and see a doctor, a prisoner, doctor or nurse when I was as yellow as a lemon and peeing pee the colour of black coffee and feeling awful, she told me to keep out of view or I would be killed. Again, that would have been the end of me. Uh, she thought, and I think she had uh, good reason. If my father had not shot dead two of his pursuers when he was being captured, then that woman would not have picked my sister and I. So one piece of good fortune was nowhere near enough. 
you had to have bizarre, strange pieces of good fortune, one after the other after the other. Without that, you would not survive. That's what I meant by it being like unlocking a combination lock. Firstly, I'm not sure that I did keep hope. Uh, people have asked me how I felt as a child in Theresienstadt, in the prison town. And I find it very hard to describe. I'm not sure that my memory is that perfect for it. But I think the best uh, description, frankly, would be depression. It would be the sort of nearest word I can find to the way I can remember feeling. Uh, I had almost no contact with other children. Uh, not much contact with adults because the women I was amongst were all doing slave labor during the daytime. Um, uh, it was a, a lonely, uh, scary existence. And of course I saw people being packed off and I saw the fear that people had uh, at the thought of being packed off on one of the trains. So uh, uh, I'm not sure that I did have a lot of hope. I, I think I did have a kind of optimism, but it's hard to describe and, and, and um, it was certainly limited. Of course, I feel anger at the actions. Um, I refuse to let my mind be occupied by anger uh, at these very stupid uh, people who did evil things um, because that only harms me. I go to the Netherlands quite often and uh, I maintain my contacts with uh, some very good friends in the Netherlands um, and I like being in the Netherlands uh, even though by now I feel uh, quite a lot more British than Dutch. Um, and uh, I uh, keep up my Dutch. I can fool most Dutch people uh, for five or ten minutes, uh, which is more than most Dutch people who've lived outside the country for so long can do. Uh, and I'm rather proud of that. Um, and also there are things to be learned by uh, learning from people of another country as well as your own. In the Netherlands, the family that took my sister and I away from the woman who looked after us in Theresienstadt, uh, Katharina Kasuto de Jong, um, prevented further contact, which broke her heart and broke mine too. My sister was too young to really notice. In the 1980s, I took a holiday to find her again. And with the help of the Netherlands Red Cross, I eventually succeeded. And we were re reunited and met a number of times and had loads of telephone conversations before she died of breast cancer. Her husband, unfortunately, had already died by the time I found her. The other woman who'd looked after me, whose name is very similar, Katrin, it's another version of the name Catherine, uh, whose husband had died in Buchenwald, con in, in uh, Neuengamme concentration camp in Germany uh, for looking after me. Uh, again, contact was essentially prevented. And again, I eventually found her again and re-established contact and we had a wonderful relationship during the last years of her life. I used to go and visit her in her old age home in Amsterdam and we had wonderful conversations and meals out um, and went to the botanical garden nearby. Um, and uh, her son, born after uh, I was arrested, uh, is, and his wife are still wonderful friends who I go and visit. Uh, at every opportunity.
If we had been sitting on this spot 3,000 years ago, you might have asked me, can there be a future without cannibalism? Human sacrifice was normal. We got rid of it. If we can get rid of cannibalism, why can't we get rid of genocide? The American psychologist Steven Pinker has written a book called The Better Angels of Our Nature. And in that he provides historical quantitative evidence that the percentage of human beings killed by human beings has not increased, it has decreased millennium by millennium, century by century, even decade by decade, despite the horrors of the 20th and 21st century. Yes, in absolute numbers, more were killed than in any historical period because the world's population has skyrocketed. But there is hope. The job I'm doing, which is educating young people about this kind of subject, can't be done unless one has hope, and I do. But Professor Steven Pinker has provided me with academically justifiable reason to bolster that hope. And he has radically changed my view. Reading, writing, arithmetic, and the other things people learn in school, primary school, are no longer sufficient. The human race, in order to be able to live with itself without mass violence, needs to learn about itself in a way that has not happened up to now. And that's the responsibility of the younger generation. I think it's important to mark Holocaust Memorial Day because the Holocaust and the subsequent genocides are really the most heinous and the most important events which have probably happened in human history. And to not learn from them, to forget about them, and to just cast them off into the past is really a crime in and of itself. And I mean, the Community Securities Trust and many other bodies are showing us now that we're having an increase in anti-Semitic crime, hate crime as a whole, and it would be just a disservice to all of those who lost their lives not to learn from their, their history and learn from their past and to um, forget about them. The survivors of all of the genocides and the Holocaust aren't going to be around forever, so it's for us to be able to tell their stories to future generations, for us to be able to learn from the history of the past, to be able to make a better future, to be able to step away from hate crime and hopefully roll back the clock of what we've been seeing in recent years. I think it's really important to mark Holocaust Memorial Day because I think it gives us a chance to stop and to reflect on the past and to the atrocities like the Holocaust that have happened in the past. Um, but it also, because of in the inclusion of other genocides like uh, Darfur, which is an ongoing genocide, uh, it makes us remember that the idea of never again, which is attached to the Holocaust a lot, um, hasn't actually been fully realised yet. And we need to keep pushing on and keep educating more people so that more people understand that genocide is still part of the world today. We can do more to stop it. I think it's really important for young people especially to mark Holocaust Memorial Day because they are the future, they're the future leaders and the future people making decisions. So if they are involved and they're interested um, in learning about the past and in what's going on today and in wanting to change it, um, I think that's really important. Before I was a part of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, I really didn't know about other genocides apart from the Holocaust. So the education I got through being part of the youth programmes has really pushed my life in a different direction and has opened my mind up to a whole different things that I didn't know about before. So I think it's really, really important. <laughs>